Hello, this is DJ Rao. This presentation covers the fork and exec system calls in Linux that are used to create and run different programs. Running a new program on Linux involves two key steps. First one is to fork a current or existing process to create a new child process. Next, typically the child replaces the currently running program with a different program, thereby running a new program in Linux. Let's look at it through an example. Assume we are running a command through the bash shell and we want to run a new command say ls-l. In this case bash will first fork itself creating a identical copy of itself but it's a completely different process. So you have a new process ID, uh, new virtual memory uh, settings even though the memory layout is the same but it's an identical clone that's what fork does, creates an identical clone. In the next step, bash then calls the exec system call and replaces the currently running process, in this case bash, with a different program, say ls-l. Notice that now a new program starts running, but the process is still remains the same. That means the process ID and other values like open streams and such will remain the same. We are going to do a deeper dive into how fork and exec work and how to use them in programs. The fork system call is a simple one. Um, it's used to create a clone of the currently running process. We are going to do a deeper dive into this system call soon. And once we have an understanding of fork, we'll also look at exec system call. There are slightly different flavors of exec system call with different parameters. So we look at a couple of different examples as we go through this presentation. Fork is a system call that's used to clone a currently running process. The clone process is a child of the parent process that calls the fork system call. Parent and child are identical processes in the sense that they have exactly the same memory layouts in terms of the same stacks uh, on call sequence or function calls and parameters. They do have different virtual memory. However, the layout or organization of the virtual memory is the same between parent and child at the end of fork. So pointers and other data structures are identical in the child as it was in the parent. And they Parent and child also have the same set of files and sockets and other devices open. So they are both at this point will be sharing the same subset of open files, devices, etc. The only difference between the child process and the parent process is the return value from fork. In the parent, it's a non-zero return value from fork. In child, fork will return zero. And this return value difference is typically used in parent and child to perform different logic as depending on what type of program is being developed. Let's look at fork through an example. These are the common headers you'll include. First one is the Unix standard or UNI STD. The second one is called system weight and this defines the weight system call that is used to wait uh, for child processes to finish. So in our main method we're going to have a simple example where the parent process is going to fork and the parent process when it forks uh, basically you should be able to visualize this part where there is a parent process running it's going to call the fork system call the moment it calls the fork system call an identical child process is created and now you have two processes running parent and child running exactly the same program even though they're independent processes and both of them will start processing the next instruction in their respective processes so it's important to keep in mind this step when you when the, initially you have only one process, the moment the parent calls fork, inside the fork system call, the operating system creates a new child process and fork returns. When fork returns, you have two independent processes, but they are identical. That means they are running the same set of instructions, code and everything. Now you have two processes running the next instruction simultaneously. Keep in mind in the parent, the return value from fork is non-zero. It is typically the process ID of the child process. In the child process, the return value from fork is always zero. So this is the only difference that you can use between parent and child to distinguish themselves uh, in case you want to do some special logic. Let's look at an example here. So let's say we are going to do something different in parent and child. Here, since the return value is zero, I'm going to assume it's a child process. So the child process is simply going to print 
it is running it does nothing but sleep for five seconds and then it prints child process is done in the parent process we are simply going to wait for the child process to finish and get its exit code remember that the exit code is the return value from the child's main function which in this case will be zero because both the parent and child are running exactly the same program so when this program is run here's a sample output you will see the information being printed from parent and child Keep in mind that here you're running identical processes. The only reason why parent and child are doing different operations is because we have logically set up the if else statement to do different operations in parent and child. If we did not have the if else statement, the parent and child would do exactly the same operation. So depending on what type of objective you have for your program, this is a great feature or it could be a bug. So you have to be careful how you set up this if else statement so that you accomplish the functionality you desire. Let's look at fork which does not have any if else logics just to make sure we understand how the fork system call works and to have a mental model on how multiple processes are created as we go through this uh, small example program. So let's start with the first line. Here the parent process, let's say with process ID 3302 is going to start. First it runs the cout statement. Notice that there is only one process running as indicated by the little red triangle there. So here the first parent process will print its process ID which is 3202 in this example. In the next line of code we are going to fork Remember, as part of the fork system call, an identical process is created. Let's say its process ID is 3303. Now, since we do not have if else statement, two processes are going to start running, and they're going to run the next line of code. So make sure you understand this. Notice that there are two red uh, triangles indicating two processes are running. So both processes will print output, and you'll see two lines of output showing up uh, in your example output. Then both the processes go to the next line and both of them are going to fork. So since two processes are forking, now you'll have four processes at the end of this fork call, as shown in that picture below. And then four processes will start running the next line of code and print four lines of output. And then all the four processes will finally finish and return zero. So make sure you have this mental model on how the fork system call works because it makes a clone and every fork will cost two times the number of processes to be created. Keep in mind in practice, the order in which the outputs appear is not deterministic because it depends on how the operating system is going to schedule these different processes to run. And of course, in this simple example, we haven't shown the wait bits calls. Typically, you will always have a call to wait bit to wait for the child processes to finish. Otherwise, if the parent process finishes before the child in Linux, all of the child processes will be automatically terminated by the operating system. So you may not really see all of these outputs without those wait bit calls. Let's also make sure we understand how fork and streams work. When you work with fork, you must always keep in mind that all of the streams are cloned as well. So if parent and child have the opportunity to read and write from the same stream after a fork, so if you're not careful, the input-output operations from the process may appear to be garbled. Keep in mind, input and output stream, it applies to all input-output streams, including console input and console output streams that we use typically for console input and output. So for example, let's say you have a parent process that is processing some data from a file on disk using an input file stream. Let's say you call the fork system call, which creates a child process, and the child does does not have any different logic than the parent, then the child will also read from the same file uh, on disk. So parent and child will end up reading different subset of data. So parent might get some set of data, child might read some subset of data from the same file because they're processing the same file. The data gets split between parent and child. So this way you can set up programs to do some parallel input-output operations and processing. So you can use this as a feature but if it is not used correctly, it'll be a bug. So make sure you have a mental model on how streams work with fork and exec. Now let's look at how to use the exec system call to run a, a different program. In this example, we are gonna have the child process run a different program by calling the exec uh, system call. So we're gonna start with a standard set of uh, headers. We're gonna create our main method. 
where we are going to fork. Remember at the end of the fork there are two processes. In the child process, we are going to run ps-fe command. Uh, notice how the arguments are set up. To call the exec vp system call, you need to give it the first pointers to the um, strings. That is what we are doing there. And we'll look, take a deeper dive on these pointers in the next slide. So here you're pa passing pointers to the command that we want to run. And in this case, it's ps command. And you're sending an array of pointers to each command line argument that you are passing to the program. In this case, notice that the zeroth command line argument will always be the name of the command, that is the convention. So the first command line argument will be ps, and the second command line argument will be dash fe, and then the list of command line arguments should be terminated with a null pointer or null putter as shown in this example. The parent process basically just waits for the child to finish. And in this specific example, we are ignoring the exit code from the child process, but typically you'll also record the exit code and print it. So in this case, this will be the output from the program where uh, the parent prints waiting for child process to finish. And then you see the output from the ps-fe command from the child process and the parent is done. Notice that again, the outputs from the parent process might get uh, mixed in with the output from the child process in practice because of the way operating systems might schedule these two processes. Let's do a slightly deeper dive on understanding the pointer usage. Um, keep in mind, exec VP requires pointers or addresses, and this is because we are operating at the operating system level, and the operating system only works with pointers or memory addresses in a language agnostic way. That means it doesn't care whether we are calling it from C++, Java, Python, or whatever language. It works with the most common subset, which is at the machine level, and it requires memory addresses or pointers to work. So in C++, we use the address of operator or the ampersand character to get the address uh, of or pointers to objects and uh, variables. So assume you want to call this command ls-l with tilde slash the home directory to be listed. Here we have a vector of strings. Keep in mind, you should be able to visualize this as a vector of strings, where each entry is a string uh, object. So you should be able to say vector of 0 is ls, vector args of 1 is dash l, and args of 2 is tilde slash. So you should have this mental model. And now let's look at the syntax to access information. Args of zero refers to the whole string here, so it's a string object. Args of zero of zero will refer to the first character in the first string object, so it will refer to the character L. And then when you put an ampersand in front of args of zero of zero, you get the address of the first character in a string. So you should have this mental model. So think of it as a two-dimensional array, which is what you're visualizing there. Args of zero is a string. Args of one of one is the first character in the first string. You put an ampersand in front of it, you get the address of the first character. So this expression provides the address of the first character and the OS starts using characters for each string that you supply. It'll start using characters from the location you have specified until it sees the backslash zero. So in this case, it'll start with L, then go to S, and then finally see a backslash zero. So the operating system and its libraries will traverse that string in that way. So it'll pick up LS as the first string in there. Now, when we want to set up all of the uh, uh, arguments to be passed, we create, a again, a vector of character pointers where the first entry points to the ls command. The first character, in this case, l, that's what the address we are passing. The second one, we are passing address to the dash l string, which is the first command line argument. And the third one is the address of the first character in uh, the third argument that we are passing. And of course, you need to have a null putter at the end to terminate the list of command line arguments. So this is the, how the pointers are set up in terms of referring to the first character of each string, and the operating system skips characters in each string until it sees a backslash zero. Let's try and make a generic uh, function that will make our life easier to work with the exec system call. So in exec system call, we are going to work with a uh, vector of strings as the command line argument. So we're going to create a method called myExec, which is going to set up these pointers for us in a convenient way. So we're going to create this list of pointers that we need to send to the exec VP system call. 
To do that, we're going to iterate over each string in the arg list using a for a range based for loop. And then we're going to add the address of the first character for each one of the arguments into this args uh, vector that we're creating. These are character pointers. And then make sure that we you push the null putter at the end of the list because without the null putter, operating system will not know where the argument list has terminated and you will have weird errors because of that. And then finally, we call the exec VP system call to run the desired process. Of course, here the code assumes that the first entry is the command itself. This is something that the user has to set up when calling this method. And of course, keep in mind, on success, none of these exec calls return because the moment exec VP is called and it, it starts running a different program, so your program will no longer be running, a different program is running. So there is nowhere really for exec VP to return because your program is done, it, it doesn't return. Instead, the other program's main function starts running. Keep in mind, this method is developed and designed in the specific way to take argument list as a copy because we need to pass mutable pointers to the operating system. So my suggestion is not to muck with this method, but simply use it. If you're modifying this method, you should have a really, really good understanding of pointers. If not, just leave this method as it, copy, paste, and work with it, okay? And calling this method is trivially straightforward. So you can just call my exec with ls with dash l as the command line argument, and in the process that you're calling it, it'll run this program. So calling these methods are very straightforward. Now let's look at how we can use uh, fork and exec to run different programs, either serially, that means we have one program after another runs, or in parallel, where multiple programs are started uh, simultaneously and they all run in parallel, assuming that you have the hardware resources to run many programs simultaneously. Let's look at it through an example. Assume that we have a helper method called fork and exec that's been implemented, where you can give it a list of arguments, it'll fork and run the um, given program in the child process. So let's look at one serial example where we are going to run one program at a time. For it, we are going to do something simple, which is to run just the sleep command to sleep for five seconds. So here, the first process runs by calling fork and exec, and then we are going to wait for the child process to finish. The child process is going to finish in about five seconds. Then we are going to run the second child process, completely different process, same command. Again, we are going to wait for the child process to finish, which will finish in five seconds. So the total time taken will be five plus five seconds, which will be 10 seconds to run. Here you are running serially one after the other. Now let's do a small modification to this program to make it run in parallel. Again, we are going to run the same command, which is to sleep for five seconds. We are going to start one process and then immediately start a second process. Now you have two processes running in parallel, both of them sleeping for five seconds. We are going to wait for these two processes to finish. In this sequence of operations, it only takes five seconds to run because two processes are running in parallel. Note that the difference between these two um, setups is very subtle. We have just moved, switched the position of two lines and modifying this makes it either run in serial or parallel. So this is an important concept to keep in mind between serial and parallel execution. The exec VP system call uses what's known as the path environment variable to find which executable or program you want to run. So you can look at the default path in your se setting in your bash um, uh, shells by typing the command echo dollar path and you'll see the default path where each directory in the path is separated by a colon character. So if you, the, when, the path, when you're running a command, if you don't specify an absolute path, uh, the path is checked to see which one of the uh, uh, directories contain the command specified and it will appropriately run the command in the first directory in which it finds the command. The default path is set by the administrator, and of course you can modify or add your path by using the export command in bash. You can export slightly different paths, or you can just add to the path as part of the export command. Let's do a quick recap of fork and exec. To run a program on Linux, you have to first fork to create a clone of a currently running process, and then call exec to replace the program with a different program. Child process is an independent process. 
but it is identical in terms of virtual memory layout and the streams. The only big difference is uh, the return value of fork in child, it will always be zero. And in the parent, the return value of fork is not zero. There are different flavors of exec system call that we can use. We just looked at two in this presentation. Exec replaces a running program, but the process does not change. This is important to keep in mind. So your process with all of its input output streams remains how it was before uh, when, the, when the fork was called. Exec just replaces the currently running program. On success, exec never returns. So keep this in mind. So when you call exec, it never returns. And care must be taken when working with streams. With fork and exec, streams remain open at the operating system level. So this includes stutz in, stutz out, and other streams that are shared when the program was forked. So you can use this as a feature or um, to do slightly different operations, but you have to be careful when working with streams and fork and exec.